Anna Coleman Ladd created neoclassical sculptures that added grace and gravitas to some of the grandest estate gardens and institutions across America and Europe. And yet, in her early 40s, Anna Coleman Ladd did something radically courageous and humane. She went to France and employed her sculptor's knowledge of the human form to mask the horrifically disfigured faces of men who had fought in World War I. On this new battlefield, trench warfare meant tens of thousands of soldiers would suffer extreme facial trauma. Advances in surgery and medicine meant they would survive it. Born in 1878 in Philadelphia, Anna Coleman Ladd studied art in Europe. Photographs portray her as a beautifully fashioned young woman with impudence, a sense of humor. A friend described her as plucky. Pictures consistently reveal an open and guileless spirit. In 1905, the artist married pediatrician Maynard Ladd. The couple eventually moved into a large home on Clarendon Street in Boston and with their two daughters into a summer home on Smith's Point in Manchester-by-the-Sea, Massachusetts, where Ladd kept a studio. Ladd was dedicated to the neoclassical ideals of serenity, clarity, and classicizing modern subjects, particularly women and children. Many of the people who commissioned Ladd's sculptures were good friends from her wealthy social circle, including the famous Boston collector Isabella Stewart Gardner. Today, every day, hundreds of people pass by Ladd's sculpture of two young children captured in an eternal moment of happy play in Boston's public garden. In 1917, as the war advanced, Ladd's husband was assigned deputy commissioner of the Children's Bureau of the American Red Cross in France. Meanwhile, Ladd was learning through an art critic friend of the work of a London sculptor, Francis Derwent Wood, who was creating prosthetic faces for injured London soldiers. Ladd soon convinced the War Department to allow her to create a studio in Paris, financed with her own money, that would become the American Red Cross Studio for Portrait Masks. So many young men were, even after multiple surgeries, considered too grotesque to re-enter common life. On the most practical terms, these men needed jobs to support themselves and their families. And they needed masks to protect the world from what war had done to them. As Ladd reported, people can get used to seeing arms and legs missing, but they never get used to an abnormal face. Remarkably, this footage exists of Ladd walking into her studio and then working inside. Following Wood's lessons, Ladd worked from a plaster cast of the wounded soldier's face and from pre-war photographs of him. She would make a final plaster cast and then shape a very light copper mask with exquisite detail from this. The mask was painted when fitted on the man to perfectly match his complexion. His own hair was added for eyebrows, eyelashes, and a mustache. The mask attached to the face with eyeglasses, light wire, or ribbons. Masks always included a slightly open mouth hole for drinking and smoking a cigarette. Ladd wanted the studio to be a cheerful sanctuary for these soldiers' dignity. Of this work, Ladd said, we do not profess to heal. After the wounded man has been discharged from the hospital, we begin our treatment. Of course, the chief difficulty in making these masks is to accurately match both sides of the face and restore the features so that there will be nothing of the grotesque in the appearance of the covering. A mask that did not look like the individual as he was known to his relatives would be almost as bad as the disfigurement. Ladd's Paris studio created more than 67 masks and more in five other hospitals across France. She received the prestigious Légion d'Honneur Croix de Chevalier and the Serbian Order of Saint Sava for this work. 
The Red Cross reports hundreds of messages and testimonials from surgeons, soldiers, and families. One saying simply, thanks to you, the despairing rejoice, the damned return to hope. The gentle wives and mothers will again find the faces they wept for. Very few of the masks remain, as soldiers requested to be buried wearing them. In 1918, Ladd returned to the North Shore, where she created monuments. One, commissioned by Hamilton Wenham citizens for their community house, depicts the 21-year-old pilot, Samuel Pierce Mandel, whose plane crashed six days before armistice. Ladd created two monuments for the American Legion, one in Manchester-by-the-Sea, depicting a cadaver caught in barbed wire, found today in the Rosedale Cemetery, and a second entitled The Cost of Victory in Beverly Farms. In spite of this profound work and her renown as an artist, Ladd and her husband struggled financially after the war. In this letter, Ladd pleads with the bank not to foreclose on that Clarendon Street home, saying, I am an unemployed artist since 1932, trying desperately to get work. The lads moved to San Diego, California in 1936. Anna died in 1939 at the age of 61. At a plaza dinner for the American Women's Association Club in 1925, Ladd said these words about her art. Sculptors, to be any good at all, have to touch all sides of life. They deal in material and in spirit. They must have the physical strength of a blacksmith, the skill of a carpenter, the precision of a dentist, the knowledge of anatomy and psychology of a physician. Not only this, but they must have training in archeology, span mythology, history, and architecture. For the relation of the part to the whole is of the most vital importance in sculpture. They must have the soul of a poet and the creative energy of a god. <laughs>